If you clicked on this video, there's a very good chance that either you or someone that you know has experienced crippling social anxiety. Social anxiety is a term that's thrown around left and right nowadays, sometimes correctly, sometimes not. But in 2016, I still hadn't been exposed to the term. No idea it was a thing. I just thought some people were painfully shy and sadly I happen to be one of them. Before we continue, let me introduce myself. My name is Joanna and I have both a bachelor's and a master's degree in psychology and today I want to talk to you about how I overcame crippling social anxiety. So in this video you'll get not only the perspective of someone who has had social anxiety but also from someone who has studied it formally. A lot of times it feels like the experts out there maybe don't have personal experience dealing with the issues at hand but I most certainly have. So I'd like to start by diving into what social anxiety is and is it. It's not the same thing as being shy. You can 100% be shy and not have social anxiety. Likewise, you can also be extroverted and have social anxiety. What? So let's take a look at how the DSM-5 defines social anxiety. And if you don't know what that is, it's basically the psychologist's Bible. It's the manual that they use for diagnosing. So here's the definition in the DSM-5. A marked and persistent fear of one or more social or performance situations in which the person is exposed to unfamiliar people or to possible scrutiny by others. So there's four things I want to focus on here. Marked, persistent, unfamiliar, and scrutiny. So let's dive in a little bit into what these mean. So a marked fear, that's basically something that is actually causing distress in someone's life, something that is affecting their day-to-day -day living. So this is not just like, I wish I didn't have to make this phone call. This is you not making an extremely important phone call that is going to possibly have a domino effect into other things in your life all because you don't want to feel the discomfort of being on that call and persistent fear so again not something that's a one-off this is you can count on feeling this anxiety in most of these situations. Then unfamiliar people. So some people feel it just in general when they're around people that they don't know, but also it doesn't have to be unfamiliar people. It can be just the possible scrutiny by others. So it can be people that you know. So for me, the issue usually hasn't been exposure to unfamiliar people, but the possible scrutiny of others. So, so I still felt anxiety around the people I knew. In fact, I probably felt it more around people I knew when I felt like I was being judged for something. I felt fine as long as I wasn't expected to be performing in some way. So I wanna to talk to you about how I came to realize that I had social anxiety. I actually remember the day that I realized that I had social anxiety and I wasn't in the therapist's office, I was in the classroom. It was my second to last semester as an undergrad psychology student and I was in my abnormal psychology class. If you're not sure what I mean by abnormal psychology, that's the course where you talk about what people probably usually think of when they think of the psychology fields. So it's the study of mental health conditions such as depression, bipolar disorder, and yes, anxiety. So now this class was broken down into three different kinds of disorders, mood, anxiety, and personality. So we went initially over each of these three categories and then we dove into each of them individually, focusing on the major conditions in each one. We talked about the DSM criteria for diagnosis, major symptoms of each condition, and the etiology, basically the origin of the condition within a person, and the treatments for each. So we made it to the social anxiety lecture day in class. Little did I know that I would be having a personal breakthrough in this class. As I'm sitting there listening to the lecture, my ears start to perk up because the things I'm hearing the professors say sound very familiar. Crossing the street to avoid people? Yeah, that's me. Getting so nervous when someone asks me a question that my mind goes completely blank by the time it's time for me to answer? Every time. So at this point, I was like, hold on. This lecture sounds like it's about me. So I'm fully invested at this point. So the teacher gets to talking about the DSM criteria 
and guess what i meet almost all of them so she continues by the end of this lecture i am just astounded because so many of my questions have been answered most significantly the one about whether there's hope for me the answer yes but something else that i always questioned was how did i get this way how did i become someone who gets so nervous around people that i start to feel physically sick how is this possible you see i wasn't always like this when i was a child i was the biggest social butterfly i was not afraid to say anything to anyone and i loved attention i'll give you an example of this when i was in first grade shakira was all the rage in the spanish world and long story short i started putting on dance performances to my first grade classroom now this wasn't something that was like planned there was no talent show there was no show and tell type of thing going on in my classroom, I took the initiative to ask my teacher if I could perform just because. And my goodness, she was so cool to actually say yes. Thinking back on that now, I don't think that would have happened with the way the school systems are now, at least where I live. So I was so into this that on the days that we had planned performances, I would actually sneak clothes from home because we were we wore uniforms at my school. So I would sneak cute little dresses so that I could change into for my dance. All of this to say that it was very confusing for me as an adult to have become so painfully shy when I was so extroverted as a child and I loved being the center of attention. I was never at a loss for words and I sought out socialization in every situation. I never had trouble making friends and I always made it a point to look for them myself. I was even a little bit of a class clown which I'm kind of embarrassed to admit now after having been a teacher myself and when I grew up my family actually commented frequently about how much I had changed because I used to be such a cotorra as a kid and as an adult I couldn't hold a conversation with them. Now I want to talk to you about the first instances that I remember experiencing social anxiety. When I was eight years old my family moved across the country. We had a significant change in environment. We went from living in the hood surrounded by family and a ton of kids on my street who I would always play with to the burbs where I had one aunt who lived all the way across town. I didn't see her often and I hadn't even heard about her before moving and there were no children, no anyone to be seen on my new street. That was a very big change for me because I went from having a very social life with family parties every weekend, with cousins my age, a bunch of kids on my street that I would play with, and a very community focused school environment where my mother was very involved to living in the suburbs of a very lonely street where no no kids ever really played outside and my mom was no longer involved in school because of this very new not necessarily welcoming environment so suddenly I was living a very different life so we moved during the summer I started a fresh school year and within my first week of starting at the new school, I hear about something called honor choir. That was not something I had heard of before at my prior school. And being that I loved to sing and dance, I jumped at the opportunity to audition. So the day of audition come, I've been excited this whole time, no nerves at all. So it was the morning of the auditions and the students were instructed to go to the music room. So I arrived to the music room and there's a huge group of kids waiting to audition. We were all lined around the perimeter of the classroom. In my third grade mind, I imagine there were like 60-ish kids maybe. So at one point I'm sitting there waiting, I get to talking to the kid next to me and at a certain point I asked him if he's nervous, which just seemed like a natural question to ask. And he says yes. And at that point, I still hadn't started feeling nervous. So eventually my turn comes to go. I was like within the first 10 to go. And the way that the auditions were set up was the teacher was at the front of the classroom by the piano. So she was going to play a key on the piano 
and my job was to match whatever key that she played and i remember being very intimidated by this teacher she was actually my teacher i i believe i had been placed in music and she was an older lady pretty strict not very cheerful or sweet like some teachers are so she kind of gave me miss finster vibes from recess so it's my turn to go i'm standing next to miss finster and she plays the first key and i choke i haven't felt any nerves at all up to this point and i don't know what it was but i just couldn't perform after i heard that frog croak in my throat i just couldn't get back i just basically stopped trying i threw the audition so i wasn't surprised when i didn't make it onto the choir i swore off singing in public ever again so that's the first experience of me feeling truly awkward in public. The next significant moment came around a year later when my family planned a trip back home for the first time since we'd moved. I was so excited. I kept thinking about all the things I was gonna update one of my favorite cousins on. I couldn't wait to catch him up on the fabulous life that I was now living in Houston. Don't forget I'm in fourth grade at this point. So we embark on our 16 hour road trip back home and the whole time I am just playing up this fabulous encounter that I'm expecting to have when I finally get to reunite with one of my favorite cousins. So we finally make it home. We're making the rounds with all the family. Hi guys, so I'm popping back in here real quick because I didn't realize at the time that my camera cut me off during the original recording. So I'm just gonna come back in here and fill out what it cut off because these were significant to the development of my social anxiety. So back to visiting my cousin. So we make it to the day where I finally get to see my cousin in that I've been playing it up for 16 hours in my head everything I was gonna say so we finally make it I see my cousin and he doesn't look at me he completely ignores me no eye contact nothing I was shooketh to be fair I also didn't talk to him however I was trying to like get some eye contact from him I kept looking over trying to see if we could catch that moment where where we would glance at each other and then finally feel comfortable but that never happened he steadfastly kept his eye in any direction but mine so at this point, I was like, oh my god, I grew a second head when I moved and nobody told me about it. So after this experience, I retreated a lot. So I'll be back in a minute for the other part that was cut off. I just got it into my head that I was weird and from that moment forward, all of these awkward social encounters just multiplied exponentially. And what did all of these situations have in common? Me! So obviously I was the problem. It's funny thinking about these things now and how blown out of proportion they were by me, but they were the source of my misery for the longest time. So I haven't really talked in detail about how my social anxiety presented itself. So I'm just gonna go through a list of some of the big ones. Ones that affected my life in a pretty big way and that's just off the top of my head. So physical symptoms for me, sweating, blushing, stomach pain, nausea, sweaty palms, tension, heart palpitations, and then also the worry of people noticing these things. Some non-physical symptoms, I'm not sure if this is considered physical. At one point I started stuttering. stuttering and also ruminating. So thinking back on the situations like, oh my God, how did I let this happen? How could I be so weird? Why can't I just think of what to say? And then going over the conversation, saying the things I wished I had said, it just took up a lot of my time. All right, so some specific instances. I got stomach pain doing cold calls as an intern in a small office and even after i was told i was doing a great job it felt so unbearable for me to have to go in there every day i would literally get stomach pains every day before work during work i would start sweating during these calls it, it was just bad at another job i was working at a call center for a hospital and that call center was where like code calls would go through so like for example the biggest one code blue someone's having a heart attack or a stroke so they need a crash cart so they would call us and the first time that i got one 
I rerouted the call because I just froze. I didn't know what to do. That's bad. So as I mentioned earlier, there came a point when I realized that a lot of my anxiety came on during situations when I feel like I'm performing. And that was the case in both of the jobs that I've had since graduating college. So the first job that I had after college was as a caseworker at a mental health facility. I was required to do interviews with all of my clients once a month. So essentially I was doing interviews every day at work and I was supposed to ask them a series of questions and find out certain information about them. This was very difficult for me to the point where it affected my performance and I was called out on it by my supervisor. Being that I did work at a mental health agency and my supervisor had a master's in counseling, she was very open to discussing my struggles. So I explained to her that I was struggling because I had pretty severe social anxiety and being the center of attention during these meetings or feeling like I was the center of attention made me very nervous. And so she told me to consider the fact that I was there literally to focus on the client. So the focus was truly on them supposedly but I tended to feel that way because this job most of the clients had been a part of this program for many years excuse me my my cat just sneezed so they knew how the program worked front to back i was just learning this program so i felt kind of silly sometimes i worried so much about doing something wrong that it almost kind of like made me freeze another thing i didn't feel like i could perform in a cubicle we had to make a lot of phone calls and i would get so nervous because everyone could hear me all of my colleagues were surrounding me and i i struggled to say what i wanted i worried again that i would say the wrong thing so i would get nervous because this role was one that had a very high turnover rate the average time someone spent in the role was a year yet the clients themselves had been a part of the program for years and years some of them their whole lives to them this was old hat so they knew way more than i did about how the program worked so I worried that they would basically call me out on my bullshit. And that really is how I felt, that I was bullshitting myself through this role. At least in the beginning while I was learning. And I asked for help at the beginning. I had an interim supervisor and he basically just told me, this is trial by fire. You just gotta figure it out as you go. Which I, I can appreciate that now. But it was very hard for me to hear that being my first job out of college. I wasn't expecting that. So then after that position, I started teaching. And let me tell you, this brought out a whole lot of other anxieties. I started teaching sixth and seventh grades, but in 2020, I moved to eighth grade. And suddenly it was like, I myself was back in eighth grade and that was not a good look for me. It's pretty sad and embarrassing for me to say this because here I am a grown ass woman in her 30s still struggling with things that happen in my middle school years. But that is one of the reasons for which I'm such an advocate for mental health because the body really does remember. If you don't deal with things, like really process them, those things still rear their ugly heads whenever our memories are triggered by similar experiences. Sometimes when you least expect it. I dealt with a lot of bullying in my middle school years that really affected me. There was this group of girls who for some reason just targeted me and I never really understood why because in my head I was a nice person. I just wanted to be everyone's friend. So it was very confusing for me when this random ass group of girls started coming up to me wanting to fight me out of nowhere. So I think that in itself really contributed to my developing social anxiety. Hello. She helped. Because there was no root to the behavior that I was experiencing. At least not that I could pinpoint. So to me it felt like it didn't matter what I did, whether I was nice or not, because somebody could just randomly be mean to me for no reason. As an adult, I know now that this simply is the case. You can control your behavior, but you can't control other people's behavior. You being nice or kind guarantees nothing. But I also know now that a lot of times, or most times, this is because of their own stuff and it has little to nothing to do with you. So I have learned not to take things so personally. But for a teen tween with not a whole lot of social guidance, 
it was a lot to process. And I'm not throwing my parents under the bus here. They did as best as they knew how. They did talk to me, my mom in particular, but a lot of what she told me was fear-based advice. And I feel like that only contributed to my anxiety. She was an immigrant and she didn't have experience in the U.S. school system. So in my head, she just didn't understand what I was going through and didn't really know how best to deal with those situations. So I sometimes felt alone in having to deal with that. So for me, going into teaching, being physically in a school again with all these little middle school children surrounding me was kind of like dropping me back into my trauma zone. So I think sometimes as a teacher, I did freeze in certain situations. It just triggered a lot for me. It really made my experience as a teacher kind of, let's call it unsavory. Of course, I realized this in hindsight. I couldn't have told you this as it was happening. I didn't realize it was happening. And I also think it might be highly related to imposter syndrome. I didn't know any teachers, not really teachers in my family that I talked to at least. I felt out of my element. So basically, years and years go by with me feeling increasingly weird in social situations. So I went from being this incredibly social girl who just felt at ease most of the time to getting to the point where I actually started stuttering, which of course just made things worse for me because it added something else for me to worry about. Like I never knew when it was gonna happen. So I would be in the middle of a conversation wondering, am I gonna be able to say this sentence or am I going to have to stutter through it? So let's go back to my moment of realization in the classroom. We get to the portion of the lecture where she starts discussing treatment options for social anxiety. And there were the familiar options of medication and cognitive behavioral therapy or just therapy talk therapy that I was well aware of and had already done on and off myself for other things, depression, but not for social anxiety. But then she starts talking about a treatment option that I had never heard of. Now I kind of get the vibe that this treatment is also common knowledge nowadays, or at the very least, it is much more well known, but I'm referring to exposure therapy. So in a nutshell, exposure therapy is when someone works with a therapist, the therapist creates a fear hierarchy based on that person's specific fear. So for example, someone with a fear of heights, their first tasks might be to get up on a step ladder and then on like a bigger ladder, then maybe a patio on a second floor, working all the way up to, let's say, flying an airplane. And this just continues to the point where the person is just no longer phased by the initial fear, or at least to the point where they can manage it. So after learning about this method, I thought to myself, I can do this. You see, before becoming aware that exposure therapy was an official clinical treatment, I didn't really feel motivated or incentivized to put myself out there because I didn't feel like there was a guarantee. There was no proof that putting myself out there would work. So learning that this was in fact a viable treatment option gave me hope because it turns out that I wasn't actually just crazy or stupid. I'd just lost some of my skills, which is why I point out my move because I was skilled at socializing before moving because I was constantly doing it. When we moved and had such a drastic change in environment, I wasn't socializing. I didn't have friends that I would play with outside of school. And of course in school, that's not what you're doing most of the time. I no longer had my cousins. So I was just hanging out at home with my parents really. So I lost a lot of that socializing. So it's no surprise that I lost the social skills. I just didn't know this until almost graduating college. Though I realized that exposure therapy still wasn't a guarantee, it was something that I now knew worked for other people. So how could I be sure that it wouldn't work for me unless I tried it? So learning about it was all it took for me to start taking steps toward overcoming my social anxiety. So what did I do? I started forcing myself to do small social tasks that made me uncomfortable 
on a daily basis any chance I could. So some examples of the things I started doing was trying to initiate conversations with someone. Cashiers, maybe someone in a waiting room, standing in line at the store, just random strangers I was around. And it didn't necessarily need to become a conversation. Sometimes it was enough for me to compliment someone or to ask a question because even these little things did cause a lot of discomfort for me. But I made it a point to not pressure myself. Now that I knew that it was okay to do these little things, you didn't have to do the things that were at the top of the hierarchy from the get-go. You could work your way up. This took a lot of the pressure away from me and I still felt like I was moving forward because I took baby steps. All right, so a huge thing that I did to help me, I had to work my way up to this, but because it was such a big deal for me, I worked up the courage to join a dance performance team. This was a really big deal for me because dancing was something that or is something that I've always loved. It's something that just makes me feel good. It's one of the things that I truly find very fun. So I felt that it was important for me to really get back into that, which is why I finally decided to join the team. At this point, I've done a few and I have messed up on every single one. That's been great because I still get in my head, but I think I had a bit of a breakthrough during my last one. So during the performance, I had already been dancing in an attempt to warm up before the actual performance. So. I'm an easy sweater, I just start sweating very quickly. So at this point I was already drenched and I had like two strands of my hair and this is where I'll pick back up in the original video. And I was sweating and I had like two little dangly things and I had my hair up and then these little strands of hair were starting to stick to my face because I was so sweaty during the performance and I got in my head about that and I was, I kept going like this trying to get the hair off of my face and I was like freaking out. I was like people are gonna notice this thing sticking to my face and I probably look so stupid But I came to the point where I actually realized that I was doing this. So at that point I stopped I just stopped Badgering myself and I was like just remember why you're doing this You're doing this because you want to have fun and you want to become more confident and comfortable in public and so I Was able to do that. I was able to stop and get my head back in the game and I finished strong. Something else huge that I did was started attending Toastmasters. If you don't know what Toastmasters is, it's basically a group whose entire point is to help you become a better public speaker. Not something I ever would have thought that I would have done because before doing it, I had the impression that they were just going to throw you into these awkward public conversations. But that wasn't the case at all. Even there, they take very little steps to making you feel comfortable. And if you go as a guest, you're not even obligated to speak. They do give you the opportunity if you choose, but you can always say no. So that has been very helpful for me. Another thing I never ever would have thought that I would do is attend networking events. So for the past two years, I've been working for myself. I needed a way to find clients that wasn't online. And so I started attending these events. Super, super awkward for me. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do with my hands. So sometimes I would drink when I didn't even want to drink just because everybody else was drinking. And because I felt like I just needed some liquid courage. I needed something to help make me comfortable in that environment. So I did several. It stopped feeling like such a big deal after about five of them. So it's been a while at this point since I've been to one because I have other things going on, but I do plan on continuing to attend those. I feel like they really made a difference. So I definitely recommend it. If you have social anxiety, if you want to get better with it, go to networking events. And, and people are always very kind. And I think so many, sorry for the interruption. I'm gonna let her stay here. I think it's such a common experience that everybody knows that some people just feel uncomfortable in this situation. So everyone's really kind. Usually someone will 
if they see you by yourself, they'll come and they'll be the ones to initiate a conversation. It's a lot of icebreaker games, so it's definitely something that I recommend. And of course, I started a YouTube. So even when I first started being in my bedroom, talking to a camera freaked me out. I don't know why I'm speaking into the void. I guess it's the potential for someone to judge me, but the fact that I even continue to do so knowing that that's probably going to happen, I think that says a lot about how far I've come. So where am I now with my social anxiety? I can't say that I never get nervous anymore. My social anxiety has been years in the making, so it only makes sense that it would take years to disentangle that mess and it's not realistic to expect that i'll ever be as carefree as i once was but there are many situations in which i did used to get very nervous that i don't think twice about anymore and i don't think that i'll ever be that girl that i was before where i just jumped into social situations head first with no abandon but i'm closer to that part of myself than i've been in years and my life feels not only a whole lot easier for me now that i consistently put myself out there but it's also a lot more enjoyable i experience the feelings of ease and peace a lot more because of it i think one of the next things i'll possibly focus on is vlogging in public the mere thought of doing so brings back that nasty knot in the pit of my stomach but now i know that i've been able to overcome that feeling over and over again and the more i do it the less it comes back and because of that now i feel capable even before doing so i feel like it's something that i can manage whereas a few years ago that wasn't the case at all if you're in a place where you feel like there's no hope or where putting yourself out there feels unbearable know that there is always hope and don't put so much pressure on yourself think small be patient with yourself and don't be so hard on yourself i'm someone who truly thought that i would always be miserable because of my social anxiety but i reached a place where i no longer feel like it holds me back so i hope you found this video inspiring so that you can start to or continue to work through your own social anxiety if it did please let me know in the comments and if you liked the video, you may also be interested in one of my other videos. So check them out. And if you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing.